your size as Royal Global University. And the Assam Royal Global University, it is situated in Guwahati, is a leading university of Northeast India. And it is committed to provide unparalleled education to render holistic development of the student. It caters to 27 schools offering more than 130 courses. One of the strongest pillars of RGU is its highly qualified and well experienced intellectual capital, which is more than 250 faculties, who also serve as the motivational catalyst for more than 5,000 students. RGU strives for academic excellence through research initiative and industry-oriented education installed with a strong sense of becoming a global citizen. For these achievements, the constant effort and motivation of Professor Dr. S. P. Singh Sa, the Vice Chancellor of our university, is at the forefront. Professor Dr. S. P. Singh Sa is a well-known academician and administrator having dynamic and enterprising personality with more than 29 years of experience in teaching, research, and academic administration in institution of great repute across the country. Professor Singh have experience of working with various institutions of repute like Department of Geology, University of Lucknow, Training and Orientation Center, Ministry of HRD, Government of India, Street Group of Institution, Lucknow, MET Educational Group. Professor Singh was the founder director of Royal Group of Institution, Guwahati. Professor Singh was also vice chancellor of Amity University of Raipur before joining as vice chancellor of the Assam Royal Global University. Now, I would like to request our honorable vice chancellor sir to speak a few lines about our webinar. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, actually, I'm attending two webinars together, so I may be excused that uh, by chance in both the webinars, I'm addressing both of you, where I've been asked to speak together. So, <laughs> I, I hope you understand. Am I audible to both of you? Yes. Yes, sir. You are well. Okay. Yeah. So Ishrafil is also listening to me and the civil engineering department is also listening to me. And I can show my so, mobile as on another uh, mobile. So I'm trying this, you know, uh, technique of attending two webinars together, if at all. And you won't believe Ishrafil and civil engineering department that the time Ishrafil completed my introduction, the other department also completed my introduction. So one department is listening to me from my earphone and second is uh, without earphone. So my best wishes to both the departments and I'm trying for the first time and I hope I'm quite successful in doing, the, in doing that. And especially I, I uh, first of all would like to address uh, my uh, river guest in both the departments, uh, uh, Engineer Ashok Thakuriya Saab, who is al also the Director of Planning Irrigation, Chanmari Guwahati, uh, for their valuable time today. And he is going to interact with the students and faculty members of engineering, as well as civil engineering department. And then separately, if I'll get a chance, I'll speak further separately in both the webinars. I just messaged the civil engineering webinar that I want to uh, exit and want to communicate with the physics department but then both things came together so probably i'll do that and i'm also very very happy uh, to attend the nano linear optical microscopy webinar by professor fujen kao please excuse me professor fujon for this you know uh, thing which probably i'm trying to do to to pacify by both the departments and professor kao is from the institute of biophonetics from national young mang university taipei taiwan so most welcome to both the speakers today and i'm very very fortunate and we all are very fortunate that you are going to deliberate today or the topics being given to you in two different webinars and my best wishes to the organizers civil engineering department engineering department as such and also to the physics department for the second webinar so best wishes to you i'll try to connect both of you in between and thank you very much for inviting me all the best to both of you thank you sir thank you for your now, now I would, now I would like to introduce uh, our today's speaker, Professor Fujian Kao. So he is a professor in Institute of Biophotonics, 
National Yangming University in Taipei. So he did his uh, PhD and master's from Cornell University. And before that, he have received his bachelor degree from National Taiwan University situated in Taipei. He is a very well-known figure in Taiwan uh, as a developer of many microscopy related instruments such as two photon and second harmonic generation microscopy, cars and film multibond and microscopy, fluorescence lifetime imaging microscopy, and laser micro engraving system, long working distance stimulated fluorescence setup, and state of the art very newly developed mobile phone microscopy imaging system. And celebrating a dynamic career, he has published over 90 international SCI publication and given nearly uh, 100 international talk, among which most of them are invited speaker. He also have around 26 patents in his name. During his career, he also has received many awards and recognition. He was the president of the Physics Society of Republic of China, Taiwan, from 2014 to 2016. He's also fellow of many scientific societies such as SPI, Royal Microscopy Society, Optical Society of America, etc. Let us all welcome Professor Fuzhen Kao to deliver his talk on nonlinear optical microscopy. Dear sir, now I am handing over this session to you. Please, sir, you can. Okay, um, thank you very much for introduction, Deka. And I'd like to thank uh, Professor Singh for opening this uh, web conference. Uh, additionally, I'd like to thank uh, Professor uh, Burakohai and Professor Davy to support this, uh, this uh, web conference series. And um, yeah, it's my pleasure. I've been to India many times, but uh, this is my, the first time I'm using web conferencing to introduce to introduce uh, to do the presentations. So, you know, as I introduced by Deha today, I will, you know, I will bring to you how we in Taiwan see the nonlinear optical microscopies. And some of this work is done by me as well as Deha and many others, right? So, uh, if you have any question, please let me know. And in the following hours, uh, I will bring to you our understanding. Now, just as a demonstration, Deka was mentioning that we are trying to do mobile imaging, right? Integrating mobile camera with mobile phones and and computers. So this is what you are seeing, right? Can you see my screen? Yes. Yes. Yeah, and see, okay, I'm going to switch screen and you will see what you are seeing on, on the web, right? Let, let me switch the uh, camera. So, do you see Tekan right now on the screen? Huh? Oh, but, uh, yeah, yeah, I can. Yes. yes. Right, and of course, I need to flip it a little bit, right? So. So you can see how these things can be used, right? Yeah. Right, and this is Professor Singh. So basically I'm switching the camera over and I'm broadcasting the image. Right, so it's back to my image right now. But here's just to show you that how we can bring the cameras. Right, so Okay, now uh, let's go back to our topics. So I'd like to share my screen now yes. regarding the presentation today.
So could you see the first slide? Yes, sir. Yeah, which is today's, which is a poster for today's seminar. Yes. Right. And again, I'd like to thank the organizer and you know uh, the people who work behind to to make this uh, conference possible. Now the next uh, here is a topic: nonlinear optical microscopy. Now I'm from Institute of Biophotonics, National Army University, Taipei, Taiwan. Right. And uh, over here, I'm going to introduce to you right some of the history regarding optical microscopy. And then, how do we see microscopy imaging, right? And this is a very uh, engineering and physical way to see how microscopy imaging is conducted or is being being uh, being analyzed, right? And I will speak a little bit to you regarding point spread function, which is uh, intimately related to Fourier optics. Why fear versus confocal? Why do we invent the confocal microscopy? And then. Again, why do we use two photon um, in addition to convocal microscopy? And then I will also tell you that, you know, just two photon, I mean, that's fine. Two photon has been a working horse for many biologists, but uh, there are more interesting things to do. So I will tell you about a development, further development of a multi photon microscopy. You know, we are taking advantage, not just uh, nonlinear optics, but also time resolution come with the nonlinear optics and the spectral resolution that come with the nonlinear optics, as well as uh, the polarization result uh, characteristic of multi photon microscopy. Then if we have time, we can go over a little bit about super resolution. And the last, since everything is connected to AI and microscopy is no exception. so. Uh, I believe it will be highly, um, it will be highly useful to include AI into microscopy in the coming futures. Okay, let's talk about um, <clears throat> nonlinear optical microscopy, right? And see the chart over here. You see on the left hand side here. So the chart over here, that is a uh, fundamentals of uh, nonlinear optics. I mean, we have a uh, two photon fluorescence. And that's mostly why they're using optical microscopy. We also have second harmonic and third harmonic generation. That's also um, the modality of nonlinear optics. And then, you know, if we start to use a vibrational bond of molecule, then we would have a cause and steam aroma scattering as a contrast mechanism, which allow us to see the molecular fingerprint. And notice that Raman is from India. And Roman did his experiment just with the sunlight. I mean, he didn't have lasers, right? And then he just got very clever idea using the sunlight, right? Using the sunlight as a light source, right? And then of course he need to do other, other incredible technique to have spectral illusions. But thinking, thinking about it, right? He was able to do um, groundbreaking experiments on Roman spectroscopy. Right, and then his technique is being used in microscopy now, right? So I guess clever idea is more important than uh, you know abundant of instrument. E even though instrument always helps, and nonlinear optics also include two photon absorption, excited state absorption, stimul emission, and ground state uh, ground state depletions. So all these techniques have been implemented one way or the others, and they are included as a nonlinear optical microscopy. Now over here, uh, we, we probably will not have time to go over each category of uh, each imaging category in nonlinear optics, but we will have time to go through the most important one, like a two photon, second harmonic, uh, cars, and possibly a stimulus emissions. Okay, so let's move on, right? And see, the microscopy start at 16th century. And um, interestingly, right, it's, it's started by two countries, right? Uh, one is uh, Degas in UK, in the UK right now. And uh, the other group is by uh, Jensen, the father and the sons, right? Hans Jensen and Zacharias Jensen. So, you know, these two countries are still leading country in microscopy. 
right? And if you remember, uh, we have used CD, right? CD or DVD is simply a portable or movable microscopies. You know, the Netherlands, uh, Philips, right? The company own probably over 90% of the patents in CD. So they were making huge profit, right? By starting microscopy, realized 400 years later. Now, uh, UK, right? Uh, I think Deca would know, right? Because uh, uh, Deca's advisors uh, in Tesbro University, Professor Chowdhury, right? He was in UK and he was working with the best scientists, best theorists in optical microscopies, right? So this tradition of, um, this tradition of uh, microscopy theory, of expertise in microscopy theory, it has been kept in UK even after 400 years. Okay, and then we have Lewenhook, right, which is, uh, which some of, I mean, we read about Lewenhook in uh, maybe high school biology, right, and then he ha actually has made 400, more than 400 uh, microscopes. Most of microscopes are what you are seeing here, single lens microscope. And amazingly, right, I mean, you can buy this uh, replica of uh, this is a replica device in eBay's, right? And then this microscopy, amazing, they can still generate images. And notice that, you know, such microscope does not have a glass light, right? The glass light comes later, right? It would take another hundred years or, or so, right? You to develop microscopy. From here, from doing what is a single lens to a more structuralized one. Now notice that this is a, 1848-45 one. It's already looks very much like a modern microscope, right? Except it doesn't have all the, you know, uh, crystal and bear we, we have at this moment. And this is quite a modern microscope, right? I mean, this would be the kind of microscope sitting on most uh, left bench right now. So it actually takes some time to develop this way. Now notice that Microscopy has been developing fast and it's had a huge impact in human history because, uh, you know, the infection, infectious disease by bacteria or, you know, of the discovery of cell, which is a very big thing in life science, right? Uh, infectious uh, microorganisms of the cell itself and how the cells functions, on and on and on. If all this knowledge would not exist if we don't have microscopy. And think about how this knowledge are helping today's biomedical, especially a medical practice, right? And it has been based on all this uh, understanding about biologies, right? So indirectly, microscopy contribute to our civilization tremendously. Now, this back to the optics. You know, after the rapid development, because there was huge demand, right? I mean, there, there was huge demand in microscopy. Even today, there's, there's still huge demand in microscopy. You know, the car size, Hans Affe and Otto Schott, these three person, they more or less uh, perfect the art of microscopy roughly a hundred years ago, right? Carl Zeiss, which is who is an entrepreneur who started the well-known such company, and Ansar Bey, he's a scholar, but he's a very interesting one. I mean, in nowadays standard, he would have got a two Nobel Prize, right? And maybe one, one award because, uh, you know, um, he was one who invent or who see the diffraction limit, right? And then this understanding helped help the others to develop an electron microscopy. So this fundamental understanding on diffraction limit, uh, diffraction limit, in optical imaging, he would have won the Nobel Prize if he did ten years longer. Right? He would have won the Nobel Prize. It's this understanding. And secondly, the second Nobel Prize is to come from, um, you know, his implement or his promotion of uh, labor law. Right? I mean, you know, right now, I mean. Um, 100 years ago, using child labor or uh, this uh, uh, cannibalism, capitalism, it's wide, widespread, right? And then it was co causing social unrest, 
And if you see how CarMax exists, right, or how CarMax theory that sort of revolutionized Europe, you see what kind of a social condition uh, was 100 years ago. Now, An Zabe is the first one who pr promoted a 3A system, right? He, he think humans should live like a human, right? Humans should maybe work eight hours, rest eight hours, and sleep eight hours. So the very fundamental labor law was promoted by An Zabe. And he was able to do that because, uh, you know, he basically uh, enabled car size to make huge amount of profit, right, under his leadership. You know, car size trust him a lot, right, even trust him with his company. But he did not change the car size company into Abe company. And Abe managed to make the size company very profitable. And at the same, same time, uh, he, he's a philanthropist that revolutionized how how the industry or how the enterprise should treat their employees. So this context, this concept actually become well accepted by German industry later on. So that's why the social revolution takes place in, in Russia instead, right? It, it took place in Russia instead of in, in Germany. Now the auto shop, his contribution is probably not as well known as Abe, but very, very important because he's the first one who systematically characterize glasses. You know, there are so many different kinds of glasses, but actually, you know, before him, people will not be able to quantify the property, the optical property of glasses. And he's the first one who did that, right? He systematically measure and characterize optical glasses so he can make the top optical instrument without uh, chromatic or uh, spherical aberrations, right? So this contribution uh, laid a foundation for the maker, I mean, for the German industry's excellence in optical microscopy. I mean, Germany is still excellent in optical microscopy and among other optical instruments, even today, right? Even 100 years later, they are still the best ones, right? Despite all the countries trying to catch up, Right, uh, say Japan, you know, US or China, they're trying to catch up, but still, Germany lead the way in optical technology today. Okay, now let's talk about diffraction limit a bit, a little bit, right? And this, the diffraction limit was proposed by Abbas, right? And then basically, he was saying that, you know, the spatial resolution has to do with the numerical aperture and the wavelengths. And it has nothing to do with the size of your optics. It's to do with the NA, but not the size of optics. And you also predict that if we are using the optical wavelengths, right? If you see the lambda here, right? That's the optical wavelengths. Basically, the resolution is determined by lambda divided by NA. And that is a resolution. And you know, because of this understanding people immediately see that, you know, the NA, you know, the best we can reach is maybe 1.4 or 1.5, right? Which is a 1.5 is the index of a glass. So I guess it's not possible to reach better than 1.5, right? That's the index of refraction of, of glasses and the upper, say the upper limit for the NA. Now lambda, which is a visible light, right? And again, visible light is more or less uh, 500 nanometer. Of course, if you can use a violet, it will go a bit shorter, but these two numbers set a diffraction limit. So this equation prompt the development of electron microscope because uh, electron, because you know they are material wave rather than optical wave, the lambda can be much, much smaller. So electron microscopy become very useful, right? Later on, or it was doing things optical microscopy cannot do. Okay, here's come the development of confocal microscopy. And if you look at the critical number here, it was in 1961, Marvin Minsky of um, MIT proposed his patent. I mean, this is a year his patent was granted in 1961. It happened to be the year I was born. The idea is quite simple. Uh, he, Marvin Minsky simply put a pinhole a conjugate optics, right? He simply put a conjugate optics and put a pinhole 
in the conjugate optics. So if you trace the line over here, right? If you trace the line over here, you can see that all the ray, all the light ray originate from the focal plane can go through a pinhole. But the light ray that can that did not origin from the focal plane. I mean, meaning whether they are higher than the focal plane or lower than the focal plane, they will be blocked, right? They'll be blocked by the pinhole. So so this is the foundation of Convocal microscopy, it will allow us to see optical section. The interesting thing is that, you know, 1961, which is already 60 years later than uh, Ansa Bay, or actually 50, 60 years later than Ansa Bay or car types. The problem is that, <clears throat> yeah, the, okay, very good. Yeah, the yeah, same data, right? So I was referring that you know the pinhole here, right? The pinhole here allow us to block the beam from out of focal frame, right? And you know whatever come from focal frame, you can pass through a pinhole, so which allow us this uh, optical sectioning, right? The optical sectioning here, right? So. This development is critical. Now, I was referring that because uh, somehow because of uh, the excellence, right? If you see, okay. Now I need to. Okay, very good. Yeah. Yeah. Now I was trying to refer that, you know, the success of Abe and his colleagues, right? The success of Abe and his colleagues actually limit the optical micro, the development of micro, micro, uh, optical microscopy because. They have solved all problems and nobody was able to think of a better idea in optical microscopy. So the, the whole field stopped, right? I mean, it was like, if you have an excellent father, right? Which is very, very successful. You put a huge barrier on the sons, right? You know, it'd be very, very difficult for his son to overtake the fathers. And the similar situation happening in optical microscopy, the success of Abe and and uh, car size sort of put a very high limit on optical microscopy and until Mami Minsky comes up right and showing the presenting the idea of convocal microscopy now know that you know the idea of convocal mi microscopy was proposed by Mami Minsky in 1957 parody if you look at this paper in 1942 it was by a a Japanese scholar called Koana Zun right, in Tokyo universities. So in Japanese, he has written something like this, looks very much like a, very much like a convocal microscopy, right? Look very much like convocal microscopy. But back then, obviously back then, there was no fixed machine. And, you know, communication was very, very expensive. It's not like nowadays we can, just talk or communicate through internet in real time or almost real time. But back then to search the paper or to search an idea or even to, to communicate the idea, it would take huge effort. I mean, you have to take boat or airplane from one country to the others. So this idea was not known actually until much later, right? until the 90s that Kona Zun's result or Kona Zun's uh, uh, idea in 1960 was discovered later on by the Western world. And this Mami Minsky, I'm sorry that he passed away uh, a bit more than four years ago, but uh, Mami Minsky, he's well known for two things. One is AI, artificial intelligence, and the other one is convocal microscopies. Now, interestingly, uh, four years after he passed away, 
his two main ideas, because he developed it separately. Right? He developed the idea of artificial intelligence and confocal microscopy in a separate way. And we, we will never be sure whether he was thinking of joining the two fields together. But right now, it's quite obvious that these two ideas can be joined together. So I will go back to this point later on. Right, and then this is Kona Zun's uh, result. I mean, he was doing all kinds of uh, observations, uh, telescope, microscope, or just camera, right, all through the Japanese empires. Right, he even had been to Taiwan, right, from Japan, uh, because back then uh, the Japanese empire would include Korea, Manchuria, and Taiwan. So he was everywhere and making observations. Okay, so the idea of confocal developed further. Now, notice that the original confocal only have a single pinhole. And obviously, that would limit the speed of image acquisitions, meaning that if you want to equip a three-dimensional image, it would take a long time by scanning a pinhole. So a Czech, a Czech scientist called Patron, right, he has this idea. How about we scan the the object with hundreds of pinhole. Can we make video ray confocal? And the idea is yes. He was able to make video confocal with hundreds of pinholes. Right. And then this is his result. Right. This is his result in using uh, hundreds of pinhole. And this is how the pinhole looks like. Right. And then <clears throat> Okay, next. Okay, and then this is how the modern, modern convocal or modern um, uh, video convocal looks like, right? It's 30 years later, it was, the art was more or less perfect by a Japanese company called Yokogawa. And if you see the represented image be, below, right? They are able to take optical section image every four milliseconds. I think you can push it to one milliseconds. But ultimately, it's limited by the photon statistic, meaning that you know the quantum efficiency of a detector, uh, as well as uh, as well as how much light we can have on a sample without burning the sample. And this is a patron. He has passed away now. But I mean, I took this photo when I was in Vienna, right? When I was in Vienna celebrating uh, the hundred years anniversary of Ansa base. Right, and you know, he already got Alzheimer back then, meaning that dementia. He couldn't quite remember people's, but he still remember his research. So I saw he was quite a dedicated scientist by not remember who his son was, but you know, the Kung Fu setup he had. <clears throat> okay, now uh, this will be related to, to data, right? And I think you can see, uh, uh, Professor Amar Chowdhury, when he was young, right, and with uh, Colin Shepherd, uh, Pete Hales, and you know the lead leader, uh, Professor Rudy Confident, right. So this was an uh, original convolutional microscope in Oxford, in 1975. It was a very simple device, and of course, it's it's more like an optical instrument than a critical biology study instrument. You know, it was not possible to study soon with such a setup, but it is the origin of many outstanding paper and, and imaging ideas, right? So, uh, you know, if you check uh, Professor Rudy Kampfner, you will find out that he's the inventor of Clystron. And later on, he went to Bell Lab in the United States, and his invention of Clystron has become a very important part uh, in microwave technologies, right, either in military or in communications. Now, uh, Pete Shell probably went on to, to start a business. And Colin Shaper, uh, he has retired uh, right now, right? Uh, he has retired in Australia and stay in Wollongong in Australia. And if you have a chance to go to Sydney, which is not so far away from he, he did, uh, I believe he will welcome you to visit him. Right, uh, Colin is a very nice person, and I believe uh, Descartes has met him quite a few times. 
Yes, sir. And then I guess I will leave you to introduce uh, Professor Chalperis, right? Because uh, lots of uh, original idea in conformal microscopy, in the theory of conformal microscopy actually was developed by, by um, Professor Chalderis. Okay, and then this is Tony Wilson. Now, um, there was an interesting story behind because uh, if you check it out, right, the book was saying theory and practice of scanning optical microscopy with Tony Wilson and Colin Shaper. Uh, so it was very difficult to say who got the idea of convocal or, you know, maybe having applying the Fourier optics, applying the Fourier optical theory uh, in optical microscopy and coming up with the theory of convocals. So I would, I guess I would just leave to uh, Professor Tony Wilson and Colin Schaefer on who actually got the idea, but uh, they separately, both of them have great ideas, right? Separately, both of them have great ideas. I mean, they have, a, you know, uh, they've come up with a very, very clever ideas on how to realize the imaging in various ways. And both of their works were realized by diff different experimental groups. I believe they call develop this original uh, scanning, optical scanning theory, but later on, they actually branch out. I mean, uh, they will go into different direction in coming up with a new optical theory or perfecting the uh, optical theory. And then uh, they, are, they are followed by different group of uh, experimentalists in realizing the, the ideas. Okay, let's back, go back to Ape a little bit, right? And this is important. Right, and you know, again, I took this picture outside of the headquarter of a uh, car size. You know, the, one of the very interesting things is that this statue is Anza Bay, and it was established right in the front door of size company. And then you're wondering, right, well, how come it's a statue of Abe, not the statue of um, size that's outside of the companies, right? And obviously, this is probably to commemorate the contribution of Abe to size, right? And then this is a famous formula by Abe. And, you know, I saw Germany is quite creative in in certain way. You know, they will put statues on various figures, right? They will put statue on great mathematician, chemist, physicist, politician, military general, and they even put a statue on a formula, right? And this is diffraction formula. So they actually put a statue in Iena, right? Celebrating or as a monument to celebrate this uh, diffraction, limit form, uh, diffraction li limited formulas. So I thought it was unique, right? And then, you know, this is the origin of diffraction limit, which we talk about, which we talk about a bit earlier. So. Later on, it was another German scientist, right? Uh, Anstel, uh, no, it was uh, Stefan Hill. Stefan Hill and others. A hundred years later, it takes more than a hundred years that they came up with the idea to go over, right? To break the limitation of these uh, formulas. So we will talk about that later. Now, let's go to how, uh, the image goes, right? I mean, imaging, optical imaging is very, very useful. There's no doubt about it. And it's a very important tool, but regarding imaging, we should put it together with other techniques and to have a global view on how the optical imaging come about. Now, if you check out this chart, right? This chart is by Roger Chen. It's another Nobel Prize laureate. And he was laureate for the invention of GFP, right? or maybe application of GFP. So, you know, even though he is classified as a chemist, he is very skillful on various kinds of microscopy and technique. So he made this chart that you know the resolution and the time required to to acquire the image, right? So here's this chart. And obviously, you can see that in the upper right corner, 
right? In the upper right corner, you would have a PET, MRI, ultrasounds. <clears throat> right, you have PET, MRI, and ultrasounds that, um, that we use to resolve the human bodies. And on the depth, lower corner, you will see quick freeze electron microscope, which probably have no biological use. And however, it was very useful in chemistry and in material science, right? So that's a quick freeze EM. Now, and somewhere in between, you know, the only thing that connect these two territory, the lower left and upper right corner, it is the optical microscopy. Now, in 2003, right? I mean, you, you have to admire that he has this idea in 2003. In 2003, uh, super evolution is just at its beginning. So, you know, there's nothing here. There's a huge gap over here, right? There's a huge gap over here, right? How is this frontier comes about? So in the last 20 years, there was a promotion of nanoscience. And this promotion actually later on become fruitful, right? We start to fill in this gap, right? We start to fill in this gap over here, right? In the low, uh, lower left corners. Okay, so I guess I will move on. <clears throat> right, image formation and point spear function. Now, considering that uh, most of you, or maybe some of you are uh, physicists, so it's worthwhile that Image formation is nothing more than measurements. And the measurement can be characterized using this convolution theory, right? So I would say, without knowing the convolution theory in Fourier optics or Fourier transformation, one does not know about Fourier analysis. So you have to know about Fourier convolution to know about Fourier analysis. So meaning that everything we measure or we see or the imaging is actually convolution between the object we want to measure and the point spread function. Or in some cases, the point spread function will be called instrument response function or whatever response function we have, right? And it was a convolution of these two that will form the measurement result. And in optical cases, we just call it imaging, right? So. If you go back and check Colin Schaefer and Tony Wilson's idea, it's nothing more than how do we go about better convolutions? How do we come about with a better point spread function to do a better convolution, meaning doing a better image, right? To see things better, right? Uh, taking into many practical concerns. So here is a quick comparison. You can find this image online, right? This is what we would have the upper, you know, the upper part is what we would see in wide field uh, microscopy. And the lower one is confocal microscopy. And obviously you can see that confocal microscopy give us a much sharper image, right? And I guess I'm running a little day, so I will speed up a little bit. And of course that's not enough. We want to have a true photon. We want to limit our excitation to a point. It's not like we are exciting the whole things and only taking a small amount of photon from the focal point. So that's a problem of confocal. You breach the sample, you burn out the sample, but with two photons, you know, we were limited the area of uh, the volume or the area of excitation and have a much more robust imaging technology. And importantly, it also allows us to penetrate much, much deeper in two groups. Okay, so you can see here, with a single photons, we can breach a large volume. And with a two photon, the area or the volume of breaching is much more limited. And you know, the two image I'm showing you has become classical in uh, multi-photon microscopy, right? This has become a, a classical image in explaining why you know, two photon has is an advantage. And importantly, two photon allows us to see deeper. And this is why uh, modern brain science or modern brain study, uh, two photon will play a, an important role. And I will show you that later because we also do similar work. 
Now, this is an enabling tool of uh, nonlinear optical microscopy. Obviously, we need a pulse laser. Without a pulse laser and without the instant in intensity, we won't be able to realize nonlinear optics. So, without pulse laser, there's no nonlinear optics. We definitely need a pulse laser. Now, there are many different kinds of pulse laser, but this one is the most widely used, which is high sulfide lasers. Dekan has played quite a few, and I believe quite a few of such setup. Uh, you can find that in major lab in India, right? To have uh, such a, you know, ultra fast laser setup. So we need to have a high quality pulse laser before we can start to apply nonlinear optics. Now, of course, nonlinear optics, we are not limited to just to see a point, just to do two photon convolver. We can do something else. So if you look at the polarizations, you know, optical microscopy, uh, it can be polarization distorting, meaning that uh, whatever you can see, I mean, whatever you can, the polarization can be blurred by optical imaging. It's natural because this is the, uh, what would happen to high numerical aperture optics. Once you start to use high numerical aperture optics, like in microscopy, the polarization will be distorted, right? So you will start to see, you know, the intensity distribution, which is polarization dependent, is not quite right, right? So you start to see such things. Now, how do we solve the problem? Uh, I'm showing Peter Turok's work, right? They can also know Dr. Turok. So his major contribution is to show that uh, high NA optics will distort the polarization. And there are two solutions to that. One is to use a pinhole, convocal, to solve the distortion. The other, which is my idea, is to use a second harmonic, right, to solve this uh, polarization distortion. So nonlinear optics is not just for penetration depth. It can also solve the polarization problems, right? And of course, we have, this will be a quite involved topic if you want to go deep. I will just show you the result. And this is by uh, Dekas Kari, uh, Dr. Neumo Mazunde, right? So he was doing, he was using second harmonic to do a beta polarization resolving imaging, right? He was using second harmonic to do beta polarization imaging. People were doing second harmonic, but they didn't realize polarization can be improved by using nonlinear optics, right? So we have that. Now, uh, I guess I'll skip this part later, right? I will keep the super evolution later, right? And uh, let's go to another one. Now, this one is important, right? Temporal evolution. Once we have a pulse laser, what do we have? We have a very good temporal evolution that comes with pulse lasers, right? In fact, we have excellent temporal evolution that comes with the laser. So, by taking advantage of temporal evolution, right? Um, which has an origin, right? Which uses the same tool as in linear optics, or right, come with a post laser. We are able to study how fast molecule relax, right? We are able to study how fast molecule relax. So we excite the molecule with post laser and doing the temporal evolution out of it. And we can see the it's radiating dipole, right? We can see many important time constants out of it. So the technique, detailed technique, I guess I have to leave it to Dr. Deva. I will just tell you the result. Once we can do the temporal evolution, we can start to see cell very, very differently. And this is the image you took in my lab. You can see how the cell, which only have intensity, become colorful. Because it's the same follow form. Same follow form, but they have different lifetime with different location. You can resolve it with lifetime, and which is it's if you just do two photon without temporal evolution, you are losing a lot of information. So when we are doing two photon, doing nonlinear updates, we need to think about temporal evolution at the same time, right? So that, that's what we have. Okay, and then, you know, I think biologists will be interested in how the scope of free thread uh, is, because there are many things you can study with these uh, temporal evolutions, right? And I will give you this PowerPoint later, so you don't have to copy it. You don't have to copy it. But uh, these are all important biological process. One can explore with this temporal evolution. 
right? And then I will just show you what Descartes did, right? He got this award because he did his job by hurting the mouse, right? And then seeing the mouse recover, right? And using this uh, second harmonic and four reasons. So I mentioned it to you that we could do second harmonic, and we showed that second harmonic can give you better variations. But join second harmonic and four reasons lifetime, we can see how Moon was is being healed. And notice that this work is being studied by 75 times, right? So, which is quite good, I think. Uh, I mean, it was studied by many people who, who studied how a tissue is healed. So this is how a mouth is being, being punched, right? And then, you know, over time, uh, you can see how the mouse from day zero to day 20, uh, you know, the wound is healing. Right, so in the process, right, Deha was taking the image in the center and in the edge, and he was able to see that, oh, you know, uh, the collagen will be removed, right, and then uh, the cell metabolism will go up, right, because the cell won't make up the wound. And later on, the new collagen will form, so the second harmonic signal will come back. So this is a very interesting story. So we published in a reputable journal paper, and that's why he got the award. Uh, you know, this award by, uh, uh, by Jens Lev, by, uh for young scientists. Okay, so that was an interesting setup. Now, following on that, what we do is post laser. Uh, we can see semiconductor device. Right, and we did this actually 20 years ago, and later on, recently we have found a very good use for it because uh, people want to do a lot of sensing, they want to use a big cell device, and it turns out that this is maybe one of the best ways to look at a big cell device. Now, before I continue, how much time do I have? Actually, I think I'm almost over time. Yes, you can speak uh, like 10 to 15 minutes more. Okay, so I can continue, right? Anyway, I, I was just trying to run it through, right? So we are able to see a detector and with the temporal resolution, I mean, we are actually evading a detector and seeing the radio frequency signal coming out of it. So the contrast is not for reasons. The contrast is radio frequency signal out of a de device, right? So we are shining the pulse laser and detecting, detecting the radio frequency. So this is what we are seeing. I mean, the detector responds in a very, very different way. Right, and then you can, of course, you can see a smaller device, right, very, very tiny device, right, and then by seeing a tiny device, you can see how only responds. <clears throat> right, so, you know, we are able to see all kinds of device. Right, that with this uh, technique, right, shining the pulse laser, but detecting the radio frequency. So I thought that was quite interesting. Now, this is what we have recently, right? I mean, company was actually dedicating us to measure the big cell, which is the main component uh, in, the, in the coming 5G age, right? You would have a autopilot thing and you would have a you know, face recognition, and you would have a profiling on the object, which only requires is a big cell, right? I mean, it's a semiconductor laser. Right? So, you know, we are able to, the left-hand side is a normal one, and the right-hand side uh, is a, you know, failure ones. So we are able to compare with the normal ones and the failure ones, right, with all the technique. And this work was done by uh, Dr. Sudhir Das. Right? He's also from Facebook University. Right? So, you know, recently he has submitted this, he has got his PhD, right, by publishing many papers. And this is his most recent work. And he's submitting his work into IEEE journals, right, Journal of Lightwave, Lightwave and Technologies. Okay, so here's our related work, right? And you know, regarding microscopy, you call it multimodality, and then you call it multi photons, and then later on we just call it advanced optical method for brain images, right? So this is all done over time. I mean, this 
Uh, this book is, I think you can find in Amazon, right? Uh, it's published in 2006 and this one in 2008. And this book is in um, 2019, right? Very recently, right? 2019, this book came out, right? And then this is this work is done by, uh, this book is edited by um, uh, anchors, right? Anchor, Dr. Anchor Gogois. He might be joining the meetings, uh, but anyway, uh, he, he could be, he said he was joining the meeting. So I guess I would just yes. try that. Yeah, I'm here, sir. Oh, great. Yeah, you're here. Right. So yes. I'm presenting your work over here. And, you know, thank you. The nonlinear optical microscopy, you can see that Roman is an important modality. And um, we believe that uh, the full potential, the full potential of nonlinear optics is still waiting to be realized. <clears throat> okay, I guess uh, I'm almost running out of time or maybe a bit over time. So, you know, the next adventure will be just, I mean, another category beyond nonlinear, would be super evolution, which is, again, very important, right? And it's probably worse than other separate lectures. So if I have time, I can introduce you to that. And here I will just glance over the slide I have, right? And from the physical point of view, this is the important part, right? The type of radiation or type of type of interaction takes place in one to 10 nanometer region. And this is what frame thread can do. Now between one, uh, between 10 and 100 nanometer, this is what the super erosion technique can do. Right, so, you know, I think this one, one nanometer is probably the boundary for optical microscopy. Going over one nanometer, uh, it's not fundamentally lim limited, but it could be very seriously limited technologically, right? So we have pushed our frontier from, say, micro work, right, from 100 nanometer down to somewhere around one nanometer, right? And in, Different different routine we would use a different technique. Right. So the next it will be uh super erosions. However, I think I will stop here, right? Because super erosion is a super technique, and I will provide you with all this slide, right? And then I will just jump it to later on, right? But some of the conclusions, right? I mean, these are all very interesting results, right? Not just super erosion, but high volume images. Okay, this is the important part I want to show you is that remember Roger Chen, I show you this video of Roger Chen. When he showed his figure in 2003, right, in 2003, this is how we have right, over here. And right now we have pushed the frontier even further. Right, we have pushed the frontier even further after almost 20 years, right? Almost 20 years we have pushed the frontier further and there are certainly many interesting signs in this uh, in these regimes. Okay, and one thing people might be ignoring is how to illuminate the biosample properly, because a uh, biological sample, you know, biological sample, if you use too much light, it can be hurt, right? So the clever imaging will be just. We use minimum amount of light and use the best modality and extract as much information as possible. Uh, now, linear is one way, and there are also other ways. Right? It's like a select frame imaging, which allows you to see the whole thing at high resolution, right? To see the whole embryo. Right? I mean, the challenge to see the embryo, the whole embryo, or even see the whole insect. Right, and then you know the book edited by Dr. Gogol actually explained that you know brain imaging or uh, neurons, right? It could be the next <laughs> than a biological front. <clears throat> okay, and I am microscopy. Uh, I guess I will just show you the interesting part. You know, the, we are really good in recognizing human face. Right, our recognition is almost comparable to AI, right, in recognizing human face. But not so good if we try to do pathological uh, diagnosis, 
right? AI would, in most cases, would probably better than human when it comes to such diagnosis, right? You know, we, we are not born with it, right? This is a train capabilities, right? So we will not be as good, right? And this is Mami Minsky, you know, his work about AI and artificial intelligence. And there are many interesting stories, right, behind Mami Minsky, but I guess I will have to leave that for now, right? So, so importantly, importantly, uh, the message I want to show you is the following. Yeah, following this book, um, Okay, this is the last slide I'm going to show you, right? Um, I've talked to you regarding the nonlinear optics. See, it's not just nonlinear optics, it's not just multi photon. We can take advantage of a temporal resolution. We can take, take advantage of the different modality it generated. And we can take advantage of polarizations, not more than just two photons. And we can definitely, by embedded other modality like a cars, or SRS, we can expand it to fingerprint, right? And then see all these things is being realized at this moment. So there are still many work that need to be done, right? To, to fully realize these potentials. Now, if you are really, if you are interested in the microscopy in general and how it can be applied in biology, these are the two very useful website you can click into, right? These two websites contain huge amount of information and including online lectures that will explain it to you step by step uh, a particular subject or a, a specific technique you want to know. So I guess I will stop here and uh, I'll be glad to take any question you may have. <laughs> Now, mm, yeah, you are right. Maybe we can take a few questions. If anyone yes. have any question, yeah. mm -hmm. write in the. Um, Tanjal, I have no question, but I have some. I have just wanted to request Professor Kuzenkov. Uh, as you have, you are visiting India for many many times. I am sure you would like to visit our university also. I. Uh, I have the opportunity to talk to you and then please visit our university and maybe we can have some sort of a collaboration work with our department of physics and your department. Your student is here, Gitanjal is here, so definitely some sort of a collaborative work. I'm sure you will be, uh, we'll, we appreciate your um, uh, lecture. It is very wonderful lecture you have given and everything was very nice. So I, we have a very good department, physics department. We have a, so I think we should have some sort of a collaboration with your department. Um, right. That is, I don't have any other question because I'm not mathematician. I am a mathematician, but I have very really, uh, interest in physics. So I love, I love physics, but uh, I'm doing my mathematics. But uh, we could have sort of a work, collaborative work in between our departments. If you thank you very much, Professor Devi, and thank you for invitation. So if I'm in India next time, I would certainly be very happy to visit your institute. And um, in the same way, you are also very welcome to visit us in Taipei, right? And I think they can tell you that Taipei is is an interesting yeah, definitely, city. Definitely. <laughs> And, re and very near to us, actually, and very near to us. <laughs> so it will be very nice uh, to visiting you, definitely. Uh, thank okay. you, Professor. Can take over <laughs> some questions. Yeah. Thank you. Can, can you hear me, Gitanjan? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, thank sir. you. Thank you so much. It was really very, very informative session for me as a geologist yes, and micropalaeontologist. Yes, Basically, I, my field is micropalaeontology. And I have used many microscopes, especially electron microscope, long uh, way back in, I would say, 1993, 92. 
and that time the new you know innovative microscopes used to come and x-ray diffraction and all those things so it was it has come to my mind for progressing your deliberation it was coming to my mind everything which i used to see at that point of time without understanding that we were doing research now i think as a student of geology and with information of your deliberation today i could relate many things which i have done long long back so we have read geophysics as i have read physics but then this part was not known to us more than camera we use for geology for the field work and camera we use in the microscope to take the photographs and especially with the micro fossils when we use the camera of two different kinds fitting in the microscope and taking the imageries and secondly when we go by 550 000 times uh, you know uh, increase in the size by electron microscope or something like that so i remember my days and it was really really very very interesting for me today to hear from you and understand few things which that i could not understood at my university days and my phd days in geology so thank mm-hmm. you fujan kausa thank you so very much and i extend my invitation to you and also mm-hmm. extend our invitation and request for the collaboration so thank you so much kita and god uh, yes. bless to help and keep you smiling as you are thank you fujan kausa thank you yes thank you very much professor singh for your very nice comments yeah i mean you are certainly welcome to visit in taipei as well thank you <laughs> So Gitanjal, you can take few questions. Yes. If, if anyone have any question, dear students, you also can ask some question if you want. Professor Ka will be more than happy to answer. There are a few questions. Uh, one by Swendra Deka. Can you take this question? Uh, yes. You, um, you, you mentioned yes. about. I saw a question. Yeah. You know, these are Fourier transforms. Um, in sine, cosine. Well, I guess the better term to explain it is that the imaging process. The imaging process is a convolution, right? As We discussed earlier, right? It's a convolution process. So, you know, how do we do a convolution? You, convolution is between two functions. So you have a one measuring function, and the other one is object, right? So we will represent the object with a function as a function of distribution, and then we will try to measure it with, you know, another function, right? Which is point square functions. So the whole optical microscopy, not just in optical microscopy, but in many measurement, this uh, imaging, right? This imaging or this measurement is framed under the Fourier analysis framework, right? Under Fourier analysis framework. So the next question will be, how do we want to come up with the the best, or you know the the high either the best meaning either in temporal resolution, uh, in spatial resolution. Or maybe in uh, in speed, how do we come up with the best measuring function to do such a convolutions? Okay, uh, is it something called I don't know multi? Uh, this is called multi-model nonlinear optical microscopy. I think you have explained it. Uh, what is it? I actually want to know more about it. Maybe the questions are not coming in good numbers, so we'll take it as a last question, Deepanjal. Do you have any question, Deepanjal? Sir, so, last one question after this. Uh, after your question. I... Well, some some of the voice is break down a little bit. So uh, could you type? Maybe it would be better that if you could put type a question in text in. There's another question by Devajit oh, oh, Sharma. 
Oh, yes. Diagram of microscope of your presentation. I have seen the something special. like DIC prism. Oh, is it a DIC normal prism or special character? Um, actually, yeah, they, they will share because, uh, you know, we did not specialize. I mean, DIC is a very important modality, right? DIC is a very important modality, but DIC, as far as I know, as far as I know, is only working with a single photon microscope. Right, it has, you know, so far, we have not found a way to combine DIC, to combine DIC with, um, you know, with a, a nonlinear optical microscopy. I guess you are referring, uh, referring this one in the chat. Right. Gitanjal, take another question. Yeah. yeah. Uh, is it this one, DIC? Gitanjal, you're not audible. Yes. Hmm. Can you hear? Uh, hello. Yes. Mm -hmm. So there is another question. The question is, yes. uh, what is the multimodal nonlinear microscopy? That's so, has asked multimodal? Well, it was just more elaborative way. The more elaborative way is just to say, uh, instead of one category of nonlinear optics, we would say second harmonic, we would say third harmonic, and we would say cars. Right, or maybe two photon absorptions, or maybe uh, steam and Raman scattering. So we, we would just characterize each uh, optical, nonlinear optical process into one modality. So this is why it, call, it was called multi modality, uh, nonlinear, uh, nonlinear microscopies. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Sir, there is another question from uh, uh, yes. Professor the Omega cost Dibin. of such a nonlinear microscope. <laughs> uh, yes. Well, this can be a, this is a flexible or this is not a definite uh, problem. I mean, if you, uh, the most expensive part on the whole setup is could be the lasers. lasers. Right, the astrophase laser one we need to have, that might be the most expensive part. So if you can have a cheap astrophase laser, like a fiber lasers, like a fiber laser, then you might be able to realize um, the whole setup in a very cost-effective way because you can just use existing, existing uh, optical microscope and put an astrophase laser and scan up astrophase laser, right, to realize that nonlinear optical images. So the question will vary. I would say that um, the price will vary from say four million rupees. Right, 4 million rupees and all the way to 50 million rupees, depending on how you want to buy Oh my it. God. <laughs> right, so from 4 to 50 million. I mean, if you make it yourself, having yeah. a cost effect, fiber laser, this and that, sure, you can be cost effective. 4 million is all right. Because, <laughs> yes. because there's a for, you know, uh, but, yeah. yeah. Biological study, yes. Right. like us or that is In the in the next project to DBT or DST, we should thank you for your answer. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yes. Yeah, can, yeah. And the uh, so, institution will also support. In a major right. way, but then thank you. Uh, so there are two more questions. There are two more questions. Yeah. You know, the first one is that can two photon laser absorption occur with a continuous wave laser? The answer is yes, it does. Except the efficiency is so low, you would have an efficiency that's maybe uh, one billion times or even more or less. So the signal will be too small, so small that we won't be able to detect it. So this is why we are not using CW laser. CW laser can infuse two photons, but the efficiency is too low. So we cannot generate not enough number of photons, right, compared with other phase lasers. Now, another thing, what, what are the future prospects of convocal microscopy and its advantage? Well, a short answer, right, a very quick answer to that is, uh, 
I think it's worth one to think about AI, artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. It seems that you know to read out the image is much more important than acquiring image at this moment, because all the hardware tools, all the hardware tools are very mature right now. So there is no point to reinvent a composer. However, the reading or you know this uh, characterization part is not so certain yet at this moment. So I have a question from my side. Okay. So actually, it is not directly related to microscopy or physics. My question is, uh, you know, now we are in a lockdown in India, which yes. already European countries already have finished. Now we are in here. So yes. how do you see Taiwan achieve uh, so success uh, avoiding COVID without any lockdown? And how does the scientific community and researchers can help in our future? post-COVID? Very nice I mean, question. How do we conduct research and interaction during the lockdowns? During the lockdown and after lockdown, how we proceed? The Indians, how they can proceed? Because we are in a lockdown for the last three months. Yes. So, but how Taiwan is successful? What they have done? Well, how do we do in the process? Well, uh, technically, we do not have a lockdown. Yes. I mean, we took many so? measures. We took many measures, meaning that when you ever, whenever you go to public place, you have to wear a mask, or you have to register yourself, right? Suppose I'm visiting a government agency or visiting another university, I have to register myself, so I will become traceable, traceable in the sense that you know, uh, if necessary, if necessary, the. Uh, you know the the health officer, the health officials in Taiwan, they will, they can check, they can check uh, where did I go and what did I do, right? Especially in the public place, right? So in this way, we can sort of rounding up. If someone get infected, we can rounding up all the related people quickly. Oh, right? So to break the transmission or to break the the chain of infections. Right, and in this way, you know, the the app and mobile phone become very, very useful or critical in real life, tracking everybody's uh, apps. However, it might, there is there's a concern of privacy, but compared with the lockdown, I think this sacrifice of privacy is better than the lockdown. Yeah. Now, there's another question. Um, yes. Can, can life science exist beyond 450 nanometer? Well, my answer is that yes, but not happily, right? Because the strong <laughs> wavelengths tend to kill the organism, right? I mean, anything in life will be, will be affected strongly by short wavelengths. So to see biology, you want to be non-invasive instead of an invasive way. Otherwise, we can just use the electron microscope, right? I mean, electron microscope have very high resolutions, but I mean, we are seeing mummies. We are not seeing life. We are seeing mummy with the electron microscope, right? So this reason two photon can be useful because we can see things in detail and they are still alive. Thank you. If okay. There is any? Maybe not. So. Maybe we can end today here. So I would like to thank uh, our Professor S.P. Singh, sir, the Vice Chancellor of our University, to give the opportunity to arrange this one and to invite you. And I'd also like to thank our uh, head of the department, uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Ma'am, our uh, dean of our school, Anurhan Debi Ma'am, uh, to giving this opportunity to university and give this work. and. At last, but not least, I would really like to thank you, Professor Kao, to give your time to our students and to us and to deliver this nice talk. Thank you, and thank you, everyone. Thank you, Professor. Yeah. Right. Thank, thank you very, you very much. much for participating and for the approval. I certainly look forward to meeting you in, in, definitely, definitely. in Taipei. Yes. Yeah.